So some people view engineering as a dull science. Or if you're unfortunate enough to be at Queens when CRISPR was around, as a terrorizing movement. <laughs> the way I look at engineering is a bit different, and it can be best described through the word imagineering. If this word sounds familiar to you, you're probably familiar with Walt Disney's Imagineering Group. But what you may not know is that the term actually originates from the 1940s and was first coined by a company called Alcoa Aluminum. And in a Times magazine in the 1940s, Alcoa defined Imagineering as letting your imagination soar and engineering it back down to earth. I think that a place that you could actually witness Imagineering quite a bit is at design projects. If you're not too familiar with how a design project works, it's quite simple. Students form groups, they come up with some sort of an idea, and they see it from a concept to some sort of a realization in a short period of time. And they see it from a concept to a realization in a short period of time. Usually about eight months to about a year. What you have to understand though, is that students are still full-time students. They still have courses, and they're doing this on the side as well. So the story about Project X started about a year ago, when the team, my team and I uh, started on our design project. And for the topic for our design project, we let our imagination soar. We wanted to build a thought control wheelchair. Not one that was in simulation, not a small prototype, but an actual thought controlled wheelchair. And so Project X was born. This is my team. And any time we told anyone that we wanted to build a thought control wheelchair, we would always get a negative reaction, especially from students who had been through the design project process in the past, because they knew how hard it was to actually pull something off. Actually, even some faculty members were skeptical that we could pull it off, but we really wanted to do it. And so a lot of, question, a lot of people ask us the same question. Why? Why do you want to build a thought control wheelchair? And contrary to popular belief, we didn't want to build our own version of Professor Xavier's chair. <laughs> it, that would be pretty cool, but actually our motivations were grounded a lot more in reality than just that. So it turns out that despite the current wheelchair offerings and assistive devices out there today, there exists a lot of disabled individuals who are still left immobile. These may be people who have suffered from some sort of a spinal cord injury and are paralyzed from the neck down. I have a bit of a personal connection to this uh, story because over 20 years ago, my cousin got into a horrific car accident. And for the past over 20 years, he's been in a wheelchair. I have a hard time sitting still for two hours. I can't imagine what it must feel like to be sitting still for over 20 years. So armed with our engineering, uh, three years of engineering experience, we set off. We wanted to build a thought control wheelchair. But where do you start? It's not like you see a thought control wheelchair every day. Well, if engineering taught me one thing, it's that you always break the problem down. You make it into smaller problems that you can solve individually. So welcome to Thought Control Wheelchair 101. <laughs> Turns out, you only need to do three things to build one. First and foremost, read thoughts. Pretty straightforward, right? <laughs> if you can read someone's thoughts, the next thing you need to do is interpret those thoughts. I wish I could have a thought control presentation. It would work a bit better than this. So you need to be able to interpret those thoughts. And if you can interpret those thoughts and understand what those meanings are behind the thoughts, the last thing you need to do, please work, is you need to act on, the, on that interpretation. You need to move a wheelchair forward or make it turn left or right. Okay, so easy enough. So how do we read someone's thoughts? Well, it turns out that the technology existed for quite some time ago. And even as you sit here in the audience right now, Thousands of impulses are going off in your brain. And if I were to take an electrode, stick it onto your scalp, and let's see what it measured, I would be using something called electroencephalography, or EEG for short. EEG has been around for quite some time. It's been used quite uh, popularly in academia, especially in psychology studies. And what's fairly new, though, is a commercialization of EEG headsets. You can now go out, and instead of buying your next iPad, purchase an EEG headset. I don't know why you would want to, but you could do that if you wanted to. And so when our team set off, we looked at the market and we looked at what EEG headsets were available. And ironically enough, it was ultimately a TED Talk that led us to the EEG headset we wanted to use. At TED Global 2010, we watched a talk by Tan Lee. She's the founder and CEO 
of a company called Emotive. They make the following product. You can actually see it there as well. So they make the Emotive Epoch headset. And basically with this, we can now read your thoughts. But there's a bigger problem. Because it turns out that if I can read your thoughts, this is what it looks like. You can see that signals are very noisy, completely random, and you're probably asking yourself at this point, how on earth do I figure out what those thoughts mean? Well, that's the second problem. We need to interpret those thoughts and find out what they mean. The answer to this problem is something called machine intelligence. And if you're familiar with IBM's Watson that competed in Jeopardy, then that is one example of a machine intelligent application. But we need a much smaller example. And so if you're not familiar with machine intelligence, you can think of it like a very smart computer program that's capable of learning over time. So how can we use machine intelligence to interpret your thoughts? Well, it's simple. Let's say, for example, you want something to understand if you're thinking about moving forward. What you would now do is you would provide examples of thinking about moving forward, like this presentation should move forward. So you'd give it certain examples, and this is called training. You'd give it multiple examples, and the machine intelligent alg algorithm would quench away, think about it, and now what you can do is if you stream your thoughts in real time to this algorithm, and let's say you're thinking about moving forward while you're doing this, it would crunch numbers, it would look at all the examples that it has that you've provided in the past, and it would spit out, you want to move forward. So now we can not only read your thoughts, but we can interpret the meaning behind it. So we just have one small piece of the puzzle left. We need to act on that interpretation. So in order to do this, what we need to build is something called an electromechanical wheelchair, which is honestly a really fancy word for a wheelchair that you can send a command to and say, I'd like you to move forward, wheelchair, and the wheelchair moves forward. So right off the bat, as poor students, we kind of realized that we can't really get our hands on an electric wheelchair, which costs thousands of dollars. So we wanted to settle for a manual wheelchair that we would retrofit and allow it to accept electrical signals. So we applied for funding, and we waited, and we waited, and then the bomb dropped. We were denied our funding. So we had a big problem now. How exactly do you build a thought-controlled wheelchair without a wheelchair? So we did what any sane person would do. We decided to build a toy. So the idea was simple. If you can control the small toy, the small prototype with your mind, then hopefully if we could get our hands on a wheelchair, we could just transfer it over. And so that's what we did. Three months after we started the project, we first had something small, something physical that you could control with your mind. And in this video, we have Edmund, who's one of my team members, who has superior control over his thoughts. Uh, and he's, you can actually see that he's moving it with his mind. It's kind of small, but you can tell. And he can move it forward, he can move it back, he can turn left, he can turn right, although with not much accuracy, but it's still a start. It takes a bit of time sometimes. But. So while we were doing this, we still explored all of our options. We really wanted to build that thought control wheelchair. We didn't want to settle for the small prototype. And luckily, we caught a good break. Somebody who was generous enough donated her old wheelchair, and so we got started. We had now a bigger problem. You see, to convert this wheelchair to be controlled electrically, you needed, you needed a ton of mechanical engineering work. We were all electrical and computer engineers. We had zero mechanical experience, and I think the most that we knew mechanically was how to use a screwdriver, which unfortunately wasn't enough. So two of my other team members, Calvin and Jeff, really stepped up to the plate. They spent day and night, and day and night at the machine shop. They learned all the basic tools, and finally, they had it. They were able to produce an electromechanical wheelchair that we could use to send control signals to and say, move forward, and it would move forward. So with all this, we now have all the pieces of the puzzle. We have a headset that is capable of reading your thoughts. We have machine intelligence, which is capable of interpreting the meaning behind those thoughts. And we have a wheelchair, which you can tell it to move forward, and it would actually move based on your thoughts. So everything was going well, and it was the night before the design symposium, our chance to show it off. And we have Jess, my other team member, She's just trying to move the wheelchair forward with her mind. Everything was going great, and then she got nervous. As you can see, this identifies, actually, something that you don't realize in this video is that there's actually two police officers standing on the other side of that caution tape. If it wasn't for that caution tape, we probably would have run them over. And this identifies one of the inherent problems with thought control wheelchairs. You have to be completely in control. You have to concentrate. If you get nervous, it will behave erratically. Luckily enough, we were able to get everything up and running, and at the next day at Symposium, Jess delivered a solid performance. She was able 
to control the wheelchair time and time again for 10 to 12 hours. Everything was going great. We had huge crowds. People were cheering us on. And then, it was a, and then something went wrong. It was a very last demonstration. And you have to understand that as an electrical engineer, when, you, when this happens, you're really starting to freak out. Four of our team members started to realize that we smelled smoke. We had double, quadruple checked everything, but we had never tested the wheelchair for 10 to 12 hours. So what followed was one of the smoothest transitions for a failing design project uh, presentation in the history of symposiums. We quickly moved forward, we covered up the wheelchair, we shut it off out of a fear of safety and uncertainty. We publicly thanked Jess for her performance and the crowd followed suit. People were cheering, clapping. And I remember while the crowd was clapping, I remember looking at the back and I looked at my family. And I remember looking at them and I, and I had realized that they had absolutely no idea what just happened. And even though we smell smoke, this was the last presentation. And it, it meant that we didn't have to do it anymore. And we did it. We actually did it. A lot of people told us that we couldn't do it. But we let our imagination soar and we engineered it back down to earth. We actually did it. So what followed next was we ultimately came in first place at the design symposium. We got a really big check, which is one of my lifelong goals, so. <laughs> and then our two mechanically savvy guys, Jeff and Calvin, now took the check to the machine shop and without any assistance, I'm glad to announce, they were able to cut it into five even pieces. We all have one. Mine's hanging above the bed. And so I'd like to quickly show you a demonstration of how the wheelchair works. So this is Edmund. You saw him earlier with the prototype. It was a much smaller wheelchair, but now the principle is the same. He's controlling a much larger wheelchair with his mind. He's thinking about moving forward, and the wheelchair is actually moving forward. So when we show this video to people, they say, OK, great. You can move a wheelchair forward with your mind. But can you actually turn? To that, we say, yes, we can. In fact, I'll zigzag for you. So here's Edmund now. He's controlling the wheelchair again. But this time, he's going to turn left, and then he's going to turn right. And you might see that he's actually turning his head, and that's to help him concentrate on what he's trying to do. And this improves the accuracy of the wheelchair. So you can see that we did it. We actually did it. We had, a, we had an idea, we let our imagination soar, and despite what people told us, we engineered it down to earth, and we accomplished what we set out to do. And during this process, we learned a lot. But I don't have all the time in the world to bore you with everything we learned, so I'll bore you with three things that we learned. And these things are simple. Like a lot of the other things you'll hear today at TEDxCW, these are simple principles but yet they're so difficult to put them into practice that we don't actually understand that these are essential for our success. So the first lesson is about theory and reality. We all know that there's a large disconnect between theory and reality. And one of the things that we learned is that the faster you can make the jump from theory to reality will really benefit your project in the long run. And for us, this was a smaller scale prototype, the small little wheelchair. But this is not a new idea. I mean, a lot of software startup companies believe in something called a minimal viable product, MVP for short. And the idea is the same. Maximize your learning in the early stages of your project by creating something that is much smaller and just get it out the door. We learned something else about theory and reality. Three years of engineering courses and all the co-op jobs all in the world, and we had absolutely no idea how to put anything into practice. We knew nothing. And so we were always afraid of looking stupid. One of the key driving forces behind our success was actually our supervisor, Professor Dana Kulich in the ECE department at the University of Waterloo. Week after week, she would meet with us and we would ask her questions, some of them trivial, some of them about things that we should have known, but we'd ask anyways. She never let us feel stupid and she always supported us the whole way. And it wasn't just her though, because even at the machine shop, when Calvin and Jeff went in knowing absolutely nothing, they got all the assistance they needed. And so you have to understand that you have to drop any fear of looking stupid. You need to ask all the questions you can in order to move yourself forward. It's completely necessary for your success. And anytime you drop the fear of looking stupid, you're taking a huge risk, which is our last lesson that we learned. We took risks every single day, and we kept trying. I can't describe to you the number of roadblocks we hit. I don't think I can count that high. Every single day, we had a problem. It would be something new. And most of the time, we just try something different. We even try things that we knew we're guaranteed not to work. Well, we tried anyways. Because when we were working on something we knew wouldn't work, we'd come to some sort of a realization about something else that might work. And so you have to keep trying. 
And the beauty about taking risks and trying is that anybody can do it. You don't have to be the smartest or the brightest person in the world to do it. Anyone can take a risk. And while we came in first place at Symposium, we weren't the top of our classes. We weren't the smartest or the brightest, but we did it. And we had something that we had imagined that was, seemed like it was completely out of this world, and we brought it into reality. So Project X for us represented something that was making a thought control wheelchair in a very constrained environment with limited knowledge, limited access to funds, um, limited time because we had full-time courses. But I think everyone here has their own Project X. It could be something that has always been in the back of your mind, but you never knew how to get started. Maybe you were afraid of looking stupid. Or it could be something that you knew how to start with, but you just didn't want to take the risk because you have a full-time job and maybe you have something else. But we're, I think we're living proof that anyone can do it. You can do it. So my question to you is, what is your Project X? And why haven't you started yet? Thank you. <laughs>